Hi, it is great to be back with you again and we're on part two of the presence of God. We started last time with the invitation from the psalmist to be still and know that I am God. We talked about how being still makes room for his presence. And we talked about how we can get wrapped up in the past and the future and miss God's presence with us right now. And I encourage you to get stuck in and try it. I'm wondering how you got on. I know some people are a lot busier than others at the moment and has this got pushed to the bottom of the to-do list or have you given it a try? A couple of you mentioned that you'd actually used uh, Brother Lawrence's book, Practicing the Presence of God, and had, had really enjoyed it and used it to good effect. And uh, so this week, uh, we're going to carry on. I make no apologies for a little bit of overlap because it just takes time and effort and patience to grow in this. And sometimes uh, a slightly different perspective on the same topic can, can generate some sort of aha moments. So this week, we'll move on to the idea of acceptance. We'll start exploring this by looking at some words written by the Apostle Paul that I would have loved to have asked him about. It's in Philippians chapter 4. And it says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul says, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And then he kind of elaborates that he's learned the secret of doing this, no matter what the situation. So what's the secret, Paul? That's what I really would love to ask him. Because being content whatever the circumstances is, in a, is an essential component of welcoming the presence of God into our lives. Because if we spend our time resisting the current situation, we quite likely miss what God is doing. In Christian culture, this is known as acceptance or sometimes known as surrender and, and very prominent in the, in the monastic movement. So in this uh, passage here, Paul explains further the type of situation he's thinking of. He's talking about times when he perhaps has plenty or even when he doesn't have enough. And no matter what the circumstances is what he's telling us. And then he gives us a clue as to, as to his secret, which he says, through him who gives me strength, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, my thinking on this is that our personal connection with him who gives us strength, the eternal God who loves us, gives us a fresh perspective on what really matters. In the second uh, Corinthian letter that Paul wrote, and remember Paul probably had more trouble than most of us, Paul describes all our difficulties as light and momentary compared to eternity with God. So he had this perspective that really the situational stuff that was going on around him was so small compared to the eternity he had with God that was really neither here or there. Now, if you're anything like me, you might be thinking, OK, well, that's a bit easier said than done. Now, I wouldn't presume to know what was behind this for Paul, but he also tells us twice in the passage that there's a learning process involved. So we should expect this to take some practice. So let's dive in into a little of the how. And I'll start with a reminder of that verse in Proverbs we, we touched on last week, to where it says, we watch over our hearts with all diligence. We watch over them and we do it carefully. In the scripture, written some two and a half thousand years ago, we find this encouragement, which is echoed in modern day mindfulness practice. And this verse, and there's others too, tells us not just to kind of take a look inward, but to watch over our inner world and to do it really, really diligently, a job we pay attention to and we do properly. And this inward looking is kind of the opposite of what we sometimes think of as introspection. Often looking inward is about getting caught up, ruminating and spiraling around on the stuff going on in our heads. But instead here, we're looking inward to observe what we're thinking, to give ourselves some distance from it so that we don't mindlessly act out our unhelpful thoughts and emotions. So there we are. remember that from last time a little bit. So what is this contentment then that Paul is talking about? And I think of it very simply as embracing the present moment for what it is without complaining and without resisting it. Because it's it's so easy to find what's wrong with the current situation. Even in relatively good times, there's often something we would change. You know, I mean, the grass is always a little greener, isn't it? 
And especially if the situation is more difficult. Most of us have had times when someone we really love is ill or we've lost a job or many, many other difficult situations we get, we get faced with. And we can invest a lot of mental time wishing it were otherwise. And it's very easy to get wrapped up in how we got here and why things aren't the way they are and what we don't like about it. And frankly, this typically doesn't draw us closer to God. I've spent much of my life proving this in various ways. Like starting to ruminate on, mm, is this the will of God? And would God really want this? And why hasn't anything changed yet? Now, the why question is a really interesting one. I struggle here because as my wife will clearly attest, why is pretty much my favourite word in the English language. And I've made a sport out of challenging any rule or policy I don't like with the word why. And there was some discussion after my talk last week of the benefits exploring why things are the way they are. So perhaps the answer is it depends. And there are times when it's valuable to explore the why. But I will say that God is a source of peace that passes understanding rather than the peace that comes from reasoned argument. And Job, in the Bible, spends the best part of 40 chapters in Scripture trying to tease out why he was suffering. God's answer isn't to give him a doctrinal statement on suffering, but to draw him closer into an experiential relationship with himself. Now, perhaps particularly right now, many of us have been forced into situations that we wouldn't choose. So how will we respond? Resist the situation or accept what is right now and make room for God in it? Now, staying in Paul's letters, there's a particular example I want to look at with you. And in the letter, it seems like quite a small aside as an example in a discussion about married life. And uh, it's in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7. Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. That last verse there, one little verse, dropped into this big topic. And it could almost sound a bit trite. Don't let it trouble you, he says. But being a slave could be pretty awful. Let's explore this a bit. So, Roman times. Slaves were basically property. A living tool, as one Roman author described them. You had zero rights, and your very life depended on the whim of your master. Maybe you'd be thinking, how can I be an effective Christian like this? What's the point of my life? Is this really God's will for me? And Paul says here, he says, accept the situation. Don't let it trouble you. If you get opportunity to change it, yeah, absolutely. Go for it, totally. But for today, fully accept the situation for what is and make room for God exactly where you are. Now, shout out to Beth and Candlin here. We're heading out outside for something I recorded earlier. So... Leave the studio behind for a minute. I've recorded this from my morning walk out of my government approved exercise. Let me tell you about America. Way back at the beginning of the century, our family had an opportunity to go and live in America with my, my work. Everything was paid for. It was great. And we went. And I read a really strong sense from God at the time that it was going to be for, for a year and, and no longer. As the year went on, though, we really didn't want to come back. Life was just too good. And when it came to it, we resisted tooth and nail everything we could try and find to find some way of staying. And every door was closed despite everything. And I was very not accepting of this. <clears throat> now you might say, yeah, well, first world problems. I thought quite like being a slave, is it? And that's true. That is true. But I've really been quite miserable in the UK and life was just too good. Anyhow, we did come back and I worked this through with the Lord and I just I actually just took the things that I thought were somehow better 
and laid them to him and said, well, Lord, okay, uh, you take care of my need. I will just leave this with you. And everything I needed, God provided plentifully. So it took me a while to accept it. And I would have saved myself a lot of pain and heartache if I'd have got there more rapidly. So back to the studio. Okay, now in Colossians, the Paul's letter to the Colossians, Paul also gives this encouragement to slaves. We often recast this verse to think of workplaces, employers, employees, etc. But let's not forget, this was orig written originally in the context of slavery. And it says, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when the eye is on you and to curry their favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Even in this situation, Scripture encourages us to fully accept the situation and invite God into it. Now, let's go back to the Sermon on the Mount for a moment. Jesus said, If a Roman soldier forced you to carry his pack for a mile, which they were legally allowed to do, then rather than kind of moaning about the injustice of it all, carry an extra one. The extra mile. It's a term that we still use today. Acceptance on steroids, perhaps. Also, uh, in Paul's letter to the Philippians, back there again, he encourages them to do everything without complaining or arguing, so you may be blameless and pure, children of God without fault. Now, catching yourself complaining is a great way of noticing you not accepting the situation. So, while keeping an eye on what's going on in your head, which we've been talking about, here's one to look out for. Catch yourself complaining about a situation. Now, let's look for a minute as well what acceptance is not. Again, it's easy to get carried away with these things sometimes. Now, acceptance does not mean we live a life of passivity. It doesn't mean we ignore injustice. Heroes of faith through the generations have set great examples of fighting injustice. And also, it doesn't mean that we don't grab opportunities to seek or improve our own situation. But by refusing to be distracted by complaining and by inviting God into the situation as it is now, we can get grounded in God's presence and we'll be better able to work from a place of clarity and insight to determine what, if anything, we should be doing. It's perhaps quite well expressed in the words of the serenity prayer. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change what I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Now, also part of acceptance is not being judgmental. Again, this doesn't mean you suspend critical thoughts. Scripture encourages us to be wise as serpents and harmless as dove. You know, like someone comes to your door, well, perhaps a few weeks ago they come to your door and maybe in, a, in the future they'll be able to come to your door and, and they're saying, oh, I've got a great deal on shares in the Eiffel Tower, total bargain. Yet you're smart enough not to buy them and you care enough to take steps to protect others who might not be as savvy about this type of con. Maybe you call the police or you look out for your vulnerable neighbour. You've taken actions. but you're not making assumptions and judgments about what a terrible person this is who's trying to rip you off. And you're looking for how you can love them. Perhaps Jesus had this sort of situation in mind when he said, don't resist an evil person. And it's not just non-judgment of others, but also of yourself. Remember last week we talked about someone who might be carrying a heavy burden about the past and I suggested putting it down. And sometimes this feels so hard to do. So then we start to judge ourselves, we feel guilty. We're anxious about our guilt and anxiety, so we feel more guilt, and more anxiety, and we spiral down. And I said, no, give yourself a break and be compassionate with yourself as well as with others. And I know I said it last week, but it does really bear repeating. One step towards this is accepting yourself the way you are at the moment, a work in progress. Guess what? God accepted you and forgave you the way you are. Why not go with that? If you're carrying a heavy burden of guilt, for example, and you can't seem to put it down. Practice being accepting towards it. I mean, you've probably already tried reasoning with it, like, hmm, note to self, it says in the Bible, my sins are forgiven, so I don't need to hold on to this, ha. Wait, 
What if it's still there despite you winning the mental argument? And again, winning the mental argument would be the piece that comes from understanding, not the piece that passes understanding. So as an observer of your thoughts, as we've been talking about, if you see this come up in your head, like I said last week, don't push it away. Be compassionate and accepting towards it as a way of taking away its power over you. It might seem a bit odd being compassionate towards a wayward thought. Give it a shot. So to finish, my challenge to us is to start from a place of acceptance, whatever the situation, whether it's out in the world or inside our heads, and welcome God into the here and now in your life. Look out for that inner resistance like complaining or judgment and just seek to gently set them down. So in any situation, we probably have four options available to us we could take. Accepting the situation what it is right now. We can pray. We can take steps to change the situation or we could possibly leave the situation and go somewhere else. Now, the last two, changing and leaving, may be possible, may take time. They may not be possible, but the first two, to accept the situation and to pray, we can always do those. We like to change stuff and get stuff done, and that's right and that's good. But let's start by seeking to welcome God into all our different life situations this week without resisting, complaining and judging, but by accepting.